Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Lewis Adams Dunstan, who is the Director of Business Development for a company called Darwin Recruitment. Uh, Lewis has worked in the industry for nearly 10 years, and in that time has progressed from consultant all the way to director level, uh, achieving Rookie of the Year, and more recently, Perm Sales Consultant of the Year along the way. And for the last four years, Lewis has been involved in building the American uh, division and um, part of Darwin and now lives in the States in Boston. Lewis, thank you for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I've seen you, seen you on LinkedIn for years. I feel, I feel like I've made it. <laughs> Mum, I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I'm excited to, to dig into uh, your journey. But where I want to start is... In your opinion, what characteristics and traits do you think make up a highly successful recruitment consultant? Yeah, it is, I would say the first thing that springs to mind, and this is something that took me a while to, to master, and I'm not even sure that I've still mastered it, but patience. Um, stop thinking short term. Short term wins are great and you, you know, you'll get some cash in the bank, but they are only short term wins. So build relationships, be collaborative, be patient with those relationships, don't push them too hard. And that will set you up for success in the future long term with uh, with clients and candidates. So that's, that's pretty much the core for me to success that I've seen. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for 10 years. So I've, I've been somewhat patient. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't jumped ship yet. <laughs> yeah. So like, and, and do you think part of like, what can maybe sometimes make it difficult to see what the long term looks like? Like when you was maybe a bit more short term, was it, did you not have goals? Did you have goals? Like, did you have complete clarity on, right? So all of this what I'm doing today, hopefully will help me get here. Was that part of the trouble? Could you not see, get, have your head above the water sort of thing? Yeah, I'll be honest. It's, it's difficult because when I first started in recruitment, I entered into an environment where there were loads of really high performers and not so many juniors. So I was kind of like delusional when I went in. I was like, wow, this is this is some life. You can just come in and go out every night and you know enjoy enjoy yourself by Rolexes and nice suits. And and I was just like, I can have that tomorrow. And then I realized you can't. And it does take time. And you do have to set goals. And those goals aren't just monetary. You have to set personal goals, development goals. You have to think about um you think about the future and, and it's difficult to do when everyone's already there around you. Got it. So that, that, yeah, that's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? To, and I had, I'd um, recorded an episode with um, a lady called Gabby, who sort of spoke to that, where she entered the, the environment and saw all these people doing really well. And that actually had a knock on effect on her confidence. But what you're saying is actually when you see all these people around you living the uh, recruitment dream, it's like, I fucking want that now. <laughs> it, yeah, it really, it really motivated me, to be honest, but it motivated me in, in different ways. And I, I actually realized that that particular environment at the time, although it gave me the foundation of my kind of knowledge today, it wasn't necessarily the right environment for, for me to be able to grow. So, I mean, I'll, I guess we'll probably dive into that a little bit, but I, I moved away from that business to go and find a smaller shop that was going to give me a lot more attention, a lot more focus um, to hopefully then get me to that level, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so let, let me just ask that question then, because that was one of the things that I get asked quite a few times and the listeners want me to ask um, is, so obviously, yeah, so you you started at the ADECO group, obviously huge brand, huge organization, loads of process, um, great training, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, yeah, you've been part of the Darwin journey for, is it what, nearly seven years? Or a bit longer seven, seven and a half now i think yeah yeah, seven, yeah. so uh, so you just mentioned there so obviously look there's pros and cons of both mm -hmm. but for you like talking to people listening like should i enter the world of recruitment into a big corporate should i leave more of a smaller agency to go to a bigger corporate like how would you describe the positives and and negatives would you say of working for a larger organization compared to a, a growing more smaller um business yeah so i would say Certainly at Deco. I mean, it's an interesting, I guess we'll dive into this as well, but it was an interesting journey how I even got into recruitment, but more so when I got there and I was just set back by how many people were there. We got sent on a training course, um, which was up in Birmingham or something like that for a week or two. And the teachers were great, but I was in a group of like 30 or 40 people. And 
although that was good to have lots of experienced people, some not so experienced around me to get different perspectives, the difference I noticed moving to Darwin was that there wasn't as many people in the group. It definitely felt more like a one-on-one -on -one, and it just felt easier for me to, uh, to kind of put my hand up and, and for someone who didn't know much about the industry, ask for help. So for me personally, although I built all of the foundational experience that I have at ADECO and I'm thankful for that, I learned a lot faster in a smaller organization. Interesting. How would you describe your first year in recruitment, Lewis? Uh, it was, <laughs> I was hung over a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was make, making, making deals then if you're going out for the drinks or what? Well, that's, that, that's the thing. So I, I, I picked up all of the, all of the skills that I needed and it just took me a while. You know, I, I, although thought I knew recruitment really didn't, it takes time. Um, but I was celebrating like I was doing deals and that created like a very confused path in the first year or two of my career um, as to what was success because I was feeling and, and experiencing success when I wasn't actually making placements, you know, on a, on a large scale. <laughs> so it was, it was a confusing time, um, but it was fun. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. We had a lot yeah. of fun. Um, would I, would I have changed my journey into recruitment? Maybe not because it did give me that immediate insight into what being successful might look like. Um, mm. I think it might have been for me personally, in terms of my personality, a negative feel for me to walk into somewhere and it take me two years to even see that kind of like, or experience that kind of lifestyle. I needed got to it. see it in order for me to want it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So, so keen to, to really unpack the, the Darwin journey, but Final question on the sort of early days, like yeah. obviously one of the, the great advantages of what you already said, like being joining a large organization is you can get access to high performing billers mm -hmm. and, and recruiters, right? So I guess you've already shared what you think make up um, a successful recruiter, but was there any sort of common themes or th things that you saw from these high performers in, in that environment? I think the confidence was amazing to me. Like I've, I guess my ego at one point was pretty high and it probably still is somewhat, but um, it's definitely been dampened or, or like softened a little bit just because I don't want to be perceived as a dick all the time. <laughs> but when you look back at some of the high performers, they were just so confident. Um, they entered every single month with pipeline, um, which allowed them to be confident. Um, they were, like just resilient as well. You know, when, when I saw the failures just didn't seem to hurt them as much as it did me. If I had an interview drop out, it was like the end of the world. I, I really didn't know what I was supposed to do next, how I generated another one, but they were always keeping consistent pipeline and that gave them confidence. And they walked around the office with confidence. And for me as a junior, I was like, man, I want to be these guys. Yeah. So I think, I think that really stood out for me. Um, I actually knew the guy who brought me into recruitment quite well. And he was one of the high performers at computer people at the time. And he showed me this paycheck one day and it was like 27,000 pounds or something. I was like, holy Cheers. Like that's, you just, I earned that. That was what I was earning annually at the time. Um, if not, if not Ooh. slightly less. And he showed me that and he was like, you know, do you want to get into recruitment? I was like, what the hell's recruitment? <laughs> so, so there is an interest. There is quite an interesting story of how I got into recruitment. Um, but he was someone that I aspired to, and he worked very closely with me initially. And um, and yeah, just just screamed confidence. He's now got his own agency and and super successful. Love that. So, so let, let's talk about the, the journey for the last seven a bit years, then, mate. So, just for context, so um, have you in the last seven and a half years with Darwin? So, have you always recruited in tech? Always tech. Yep. Always tech. Um, so joined in as a, what, a recruiter, I'm assuming, or resourcer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So joined as a trainee, essentially. I I left Computer People and was just looking for that smaller shop and was happy to just get the opportunity to learn. So went in as a trainee consultant. Yeah. And then you've been on that typical trajectory of, of people that achieve it, of like getting in at that level to, to now obviously directorship, right? And we'll, we'll unpack that. Um, yeah. But uh, have you always been then, find a bit of context for people listening, have you always been in perm then? Or has it been contract and perm? What's well, been your journey with that? Yeah, always perm. I think I've probably placed three contractors in my 
career. Okay, um, so predominantly yeah, perm, yeah? Always, always perm, yeah. All right. So let's talk about that first year quickly then. Mm -hmm. Rookie of the year. Yeah. Why did Lewis achieve that? Um, I, I entered into a new market. We was working in the Danish market. It was untouched for our business at the time. And to be honest with you, it was pretty untouched by recruitment in general. So I, I did definitely have some level of advantage going into this market. It was a market that was picking up. It was booming. Um, there were some hot technologies that just landed around kind of Node.js, Angular, JavaScript at the time. And no joke, mate, when I was calling clients or prospect businesses and saying, hey, look, I've got this, this guy or girl that could be of interest in your business, these are their skill sets. They were like, wait, what? You're going to help us? I was like, yeah, 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 I'm going to help you. It just costs you 20%. They was like, all right, cool. Um, let's get started. It was like, wow, this is, this is really, it, honestly, it was so untouched. I probably could count on one hand the amount of competition I had. And, and even then we weren't, there was so much opportunity there. We weren't even knocking heads. And when we did, there was like a really good level of respect that, you know, we are the almost the founding fathers out here of, of the recruitment space. And I, I know it's changed quite a bit since then, but um, that allowed me to, to, pick up some really good businesses and repeat business was the key to success in my first year. Um, nice. Multiple placements, at, you know, two or three companies that, that really valued what we did as, as yeah, a recruitment so that, agency. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. You, for a second, you can sort of share how you've refined this or got even better at this uh, as you've gone on. But so I guess, firstly, like what, so just for context, what did you end up billing in your first year then? Do you know? 156. Okay, thousand pounds. Pretty yeah. much stand start market from a right? new a market that didn't exist. Clients we didn't have, um, and I'll, I'll be honest. You know, I, I probably fluffed up some of the numbers to even get my job in the first place. So I, I ultimately said I probably did better than I, I actually did <laughs> the deco just to secure the job because. And so, so I kind of almost applied an immediate pressure on me um, mm. to perform, which which actually was really beneficial. So they expected more from me than actually I'd ever delivered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, what so when you started to realize that this was on taps like what did you do to make sure you weren't complacent um i i spent a lot of time going on business trips that was that that kind of stopped me being complacent because every time i went on a business trip i forced myself to go and meet new businesses and i really enjoyed that part to be honest like who doesn't traveling going out having nice meals going for drinks like i tried to to make the business development side as fun as i possibly could for me and i think from a young age when i, I spent a lot of time on golf courses and, and around like older people i developed an ability to be able to just communicate with people from all different walks of life quite quickly so i just enjoyed it mate like that that's what kept me fresh um mm. consistently trying to create new relationships and quickly the team developed and grew around me. Um, I wasn't actually initially leading that team as it grew. We had a, a couple of different managers that done that until there was a point where, you know, I, I, I got kind of tapped on the shoulder and was like, hey, do you want to lead this team? And everyone seemed to kind of buy in. Um, but yeah, just just keeping it fresh by by consistently meeting new businesses and new people. So how, how long did you work the Danish market then before you transitioned to the US market? So, um, in terms of joining the business, um, I was there for four years, four and a half years. Mm. Yeah, four years, and then okay. uh, and then we started transitioning, handing over everything we had in Denmark. Literally, I mean, it was crazy. We was working all hours under the sun, but till two, three in the morning. We were incubated in the UK, but working the the US markets. And oh, okay, yeah, it was it was really it was really fun. We we built a really good team up initially, and. Um, and we just we just enjoyed it. It was quite nice waking up at ten o'clock in the morning, going and making some breakfast, going down to the gym, and then starting my day like at twelve. So that that was pretty cool, but it was okay. a slog. It was a real yeah, slog. So it, it, yeah, definitely keen to dig into that. But just, yeah. just I just want to make sure that we just uncover some learnings that you experienced in the yeah. going from untapped market, doing that first year, and then you, let's dig into the US if that's okay with you. Of course, yeah, yeah. So. So four years on the Danish market, when did you start taking up management responsibilities? So I won Rookie of the Year 10 months into my career at Dodd. Um, and shortly after that, seven months after that, I actually moved into a senior position. And then about a year or so after that, I moved into a team leadership position. So okay. yeah, I led that team for just, just kind of two-ish years. 
And how many people ended up in that team? Uh, six people in the team. Okay, nice. Yeah. So how was, um, how did you manage that? Like just having to focus on Lewis and Lewis's billings to being responsible for other people. How was that transition? To be honest with you, it, it wasn't smooth. Um, I just assumed early on that I could just hire people that were like me and they would just follow the same process that I did, which really didn't have much structure and they would just pick it up. You know, maybe I was a little bit sport when I went to the market, the BD came easily, you know, now we're like two or so years in and it started to get a little bit tougher because more agencies were out there winning business. Um, so my initial approach was wrong. I just, you know, I hired a couple of people that were very similar to me and they were really good, but it became a challenge because we had three or four personalities that were exactly the same. And, and it was, yeah, there were some heated moments, shall we say, but they were all, <laughs> but they were all super capable individuals. Like some of them have gone, in fact, one of them has gone on to start his own agency. Um, a couple of them have gone, gone internal. Um, but generally speaking, very good individuals. We just, I just should have created a little bit more diversity. And I didn't really know what that meant when I first went yeah. into leadership. Um, yeah, because what, what would you do different then to avoid that? I would just be more open-minded when I was interviewing. Um, I wouldn't be asking specific questions that I were relating back to me. And I, I shouldn't have been looking for people that I wanted to go for drinks with. Um, you know, that, that kind of, I should have perhaps separated that personal interest just to have a good laugh as opposed to like, what's going to make this team successful. Mm. So I think the interview process, and let's be honest, like we're all recruiters and we all give advice on, on what people should do when they're going for interviews. But how many of us actually know how to interview? <laughs> like a very small percentage of us actually know how to interview effectively, what traits to look for, um, how not to be biased. Like it's difficult. Like it is an art. Mm. Yeah, I think there, there's like a lot of people who are quick to do what you did and then they then learn, right, okay, we need to actually build a bit of science around what we're looking for, what we need, where and, and those things, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we just we just didn't have that when we first started. Um, so we kind of, we started to develop and change that and we brought in some different people from across the business, not necessarily just managers. Like there is an element of, of involving other people and empowering people in the business that can be involved in decision making when it comes to growth. Like that just does so much good for the company. Mm. Um, so we changed that and, and we started to see much better progress. Interesting. So what would you say was the, so at a Deco, did, did you, did you do the UK market? Yeah. Yeah. Java. Maybe. So what, what keen to get your thoughts on this for the, for the America as well, but like in the, in the Danish market for those listening that might be, I don't know, in the process of expanding to, yeah. to the EU and, and other markets. But like, what would you say were the main differences in terms of culture that you had to adapt to quite quickly and learn and get better at? Between here and America, uh, between Europe and like America? In the, in the, yeah, in the Danish market. What, what things did you have to pick up on quite quickly in terms of the culture that you had to adapt to? To be honest with you, in a Danish market, you could just be very direct. You go straight to the CEO, really? straight to the CTO or the hiring manager, tell them what you've got. Um, they're quite direct kind of black and white people as well. So, you know, bring value immediately um, and, and they'll respect what you're, you're offering. Um, you can only really do that if you actually research a business and understand what they're doing, understand what they might be looking for. That's the quickest way to add value, like putting that little bit of time in before um, and then going straight to the straight to the heart of the business, you know. Whereas moving to America, we thought we could essentially bring that same approach here and it just worked and it didn't. It, it, it just didn't, it, it, we failed miserably at it. And we struggled to pick up business. We pissed a lot of people off. Um, we realized that actually there is a much bigger focus on internal recruitment out here in America. And that actually a lot of the internal recruiters at businesses essentially are your clients. And really? if you try, yeah, if you try and bypass them or try and kind of cut them out, they do have the power to stop you working with the business. So there's an element of just kind of, we didn't know that when we first got here. So we, we just kept making mistakes. And then we just <laughs> over time, we started to realize that, wait, what are we doing wrong here? And we had a couple of good relationships with recruiters and they can do so much for you. 
and any recruiter that really values your your worth maybe even they've come from an external background themselves so they know what the grind's like you know um that will still involve hiring managers it's just a slightly different sell you just have to convince them that you're not trying to like push them out of their role you're not trying to create an opportunity for for them to look bad actually what you are is an addition to their skill set and actually their ability to be able to build a good relationship or partnership with an external agency is as valuable as them finding candidates themselves yeah that's really interesting so so let's talk about um the, the journey of america then so then so where where why did lewis get this opportunity to look at the american like where did that come from how did you get that opportunity i think to be honest i've always quite i found it quite difficult to have like a really clear vision of where I wanted to take my career. But I had really good management around me that could see potential in what I was doing. And the impact that I was making, they kind of saw and was like, okay, cool. You're really someone that people follow that someone wants to actually kind of imitate and, and potentially try and kind of like beat in terms of a competitive nature around recruitment. And I think that would be a good trait to take to America. And, and I guess just my enthusiasm, my, pa I guess you can confuse it, a passion uh, for recruitment and just like winning. My CEO kind of had a chat with me and said, hey, do you want to kind of lead our US operations? And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. He said, all right, think about it. I was like, no, I'll do it. Definitely. I've always wanted to live in America. I don't know why. Really? Yeah. I, I, I guess I'm a golfer as well. So I guess the golf hat is good, which is kind of one of the reasons I wanted to be here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just gave me the opportunity and, and then kind of like along the way trained me to, to get to better understand how to run a business just from a business strategy perspective as opposed to just a recruitment perspective. Yeah. So like what, what was the go to America strategy? So, so you obviously, well, obviously you made plenty of mistakes, but like what was the actual initial plan? How long was you going to be in the UK for and build it up before you mm -hmm. tried to go over? What, what? Tell us a bit about the plan and how you approached it. Yeah. So the original plan was... We grow the team to, to four or five people, um, which which in the UK in the UK, which was kind of difficult as well because we we gave the opportunity for anyone internal to put their hands up, um, and no one did. So it was really? like, oh yeah, surprisingly, I think we, we we had quite a young culture at the time. It's much more diverse now, um, and I think it was just a big change for a lot of people. Mm. Um, our office is located in Essex in Bitteriki, our, our HQ, and I think people just really liked being in Essex. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I don't know, yeah. but it's, it's quite a big jump to take for, you know, a, someone in their early twenties, I guess. And the commitment initially as well, which would be to be working from 12 to 11, 12, one, two in the morning and pretty much sacrificing your personal life for that period of time before we get there. So there was an expectation around us being able to achieve certain figures over a three month period that would then kind of unlock the door for us to go to America that said, okay, right. now we're profitable to be able to cover the costs of travel, visas, salaries, commissions, everything like that. And and what was that out of interest? It was a hundred thousand dollars per month for yeah. three months consistently. So what a hundred K months, hundred K months for three months consistently. And to wow. be honest with you, yeah, it, it was, it was a stretch. Um, and what, was you, what, would, what did you end up doing, like finishing when you was experiencing the Danish market? Was you doing anything near that? In terms of the team? In terms of like, yeah, bill, just billing, yeah, billings as a, as a whole. Like, did so that I, seem like completely unattainable? It, it didn't because as far as the, the deal size and deal values go out here, like they're not comparable. So I was probably averaging between 12 and 15K in Denmark, my average deal size. And I finished on 250, 300K year on year for, for right. you know, for some time. And, and we did a couple of placements in America quite quickly. And they were like 30, 40K each. Wow. And it was like, holy shit. And why is, why is that? Is that because salaries are large? Is it because the percentages are bigger? Why is salary, that? Salary is larger. The percentages aren't, aren't big. Well, I guess they are comparative to Denmark. You know, it's much more... Um, you, you see kind of 20, 22, 25, sometimes even 30%. It's much more common in America. In America yeah. yeah. And then depending on what kind of market you're working, obviously, like we kind of shifted towards data eventually. The average salary ranges between 150 and 180K. Okay. So, so, you, had to, so you had to do 100K months, three months, back to back. 
yeah did that so like so you mentioned you did a couple of deals quickly like how how did you even approach this because america is so vast like what state did you go after did you just focus on one state what how what, what was the strategy well that's to to be quite honest and i you know i wouldn't be lying in saying i think that's what our challenge was is that we didn't right. have a clear enough strategy to turn around and say okay these are the exact markets that we're going to be working these are the technologies that we're going to be supporting. These are the types of businesses we're going to be focusing on. And don't get me wrong, like we were all experienced, so we kind of knew what we needed to do. But we, it was a lot, it was a lot of trial and error. And I think yeah. if we were to do it again, we would go in with a much clearer strategy, with much more research in terms of like which locations, which technologies, which businesses. Also, on top of that, where are we most likely to be able to grow in terms of the actual team itself? And um, initially, we was actually going to Atlanta. So I was quite fortunate to go back and forward to Atlanta seven or eight times, um, meeting businesses, checking out offices, um, obviously running the social side of it as well to see what it was like to actually live there. And it was fun. It was super fun. But it was very clear that in, I guess, in the South, the salaries were just so much lower. Really? And funnily enough, I ended up leveraging one of my relationships from Denmark with a gentleman that ended up going and working for a major corporation out here. And he brought us in and, and secured the client in Boston. So wow. he was like, yeah, he that, and that kind of actually shaped the rest of our business because we ended up with a load of machine learning roles and we all looked at each other like, what the, the hell is machine learning? Really? We, we were, yeah, we were going for like front end, back end, product based roles and, and there's huge demand for that, but the salaries are a lot lower. And then we, we learned about machine learning, I think, one of our first placements in America was an NLP guy and and the fee was like 40K. And we was like, what? Cheers. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> so instantly that carved out our strategy. We was like, okay, we're now data experts. Um, nice. Or at least not experts. You know, we were going to develop yeah, our you, business to become the, experts. The focus. So I think what I love about that, Lewis, is like a lot of people can – not give themselves an opportunity for that to happen and what i mean by that is what you did was take action right and i think like that's the sort of lesson there really whereas yes ideally if we were to go back and start again let's have a bit of a strategy and a plan as to what we're going to focus on yeah. but at the same time don't discount the power and taking action and learning making mistakes and then going actually fuck this is a great opportunity here we are let's go do you know what i mean absolutely so and look how, how did you go about learning that market then once you recognize that I think there's really only one way to learn it and that's to be in it. So picking up the phone, talking to any, as many people as we could in the industry. Um, I mean, we're here now, right? You're asking me questions. Everyone loves talking about themselves. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very easy to talk to someone, um, leverage that next relationship with the next one and the next one and the next one. And, and just, just ask, just ask questions. Like I'm a true believer in there's no stupid questions. Um, mm actually you're stupid if you don't ask certain questions because at the end of the day if you don't ask them you don't pick up that knowledge and you end up missing out on a placement or you know an understanding of a job requirement you end up taking too much time trying to trying to find the wrong people so i was always cool with just asking re very basic questions and and looking for very basic answers and i guess data science is quite a broad term we kind of initially really kind of went into a niche of nlp and machine learning and natural language processing is, is pretty simple to, to understand. And once you get that understanding of it, what's also very good is that there really is only one or two different styles of NLP candidate that, that are good. Um, and then you've got all the aspiring ones. So we instantly knew who to reach out to that would then lead to us having really good product to take to the market. Right. So how, um, how long did it take to get up to the 100K months? took a while mate it took a while um it was funny because we we actually hired, we hired a guy and in his first month did four placements with a business and did 98k <laughs> like and was like and they went in within i think we was actually at our christmas party and you got four separate calls from the hiring manager saying we're hiring him we're hiring him we're hiring him we're hiring him and we was like oh what God. what so we that was the first time that, that kicked in and that was after three months that we kind of got very close and then we kept like having one month where we almost got there then we'd miss it then we almost got there and we'd miss it and we were incubated for a year and a half before wow. before we got to that point it took a while that being said there was also some processes and stuff 
behind closed doors that were going on in terms of us getting our visas, um, securing office locations, um, everything else that goes with setting a business. So it wasn't that kind of unlocked the door, then that would allow us to get everything in place. And I think it was 2017 or 18 now, I can't remember, in, in January that we arrived okay. um, as as three people. So so just real quick ones, so if I'm if I'm listening right now and I'm in the process of building out a brand new market or looking at building out a market, like how, how long would you give it? Do you think then? Cause you've done it, ended up doing it in, in the Danish market, done it in the U S market. Like yeah. how long should I be giving it before I'm like, right, actually do we need to pivot? Do we need to make changes? What would you say is like the ideal time period? I would say the ideal time period is six months being that you've done the research prior. Yeah. I think you have to allow for time and especially now the way things are, you know, um, with the world and, and COVID and what have you. Six months is a, is a fair run rate that allows you to pick up business, that allows you to make some progress, build relationships, maybe get a client or two that might have multiple hires. Um, at that point, if you're really not seeing progress, I would really consider pivoting into a different industry or or sector. Or really you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Lewis, what was your most effective way of growing your client base then? in this American market. So, so you went on that trial and error journey of, yeah, machine learning, old contact helped you, mm-hmm. and not focusing on that. Like what ended up being your like main way of um, generating clients? Recommendations. That almost plain and simply, I even when I didn't place people, I asked for recommendations. Um, even if they went to a new business, I would follow up with them, see how they were getting on. Um, even when I did place them, you know, even more so following up, seeing how they're getting on in the job, asking about who they know. And it's quite, it's somewhat of a small market, the machine learning world, when it comes to like the, the big, the big fish or the big players. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of aspiring data scientists, but it is quite a close knit circle. And if you land a good client or you land a good contact, you're kind of in a very, very good position. And I was very fortunate to, to land a client and the particular gentleman that, that founded that company was one of the godfathers of, of NLP. And having that access to his business in terms of growing it, which firstly, they were paying like three, 400K per employee that they brought on. So the fees were fucking huge. Oh my God. Yeah, the fees were huge. But the, these are like the most elite people in, in, in America. But that gave me access to call people and say, hey, I'm working with this guy. And regardless of whether they they were interested in moving or not. They wanted to talk to me. So right. it, it kind of, I was very fortunate in that sense. And, and I think anyone can do that. If you pick up the right business or you find the right leader, you leverage that to then, you know, make yourself more successful yeah. elsewhere. So, so you, you always, you always hear like referrals, right? But like, for it, like in your opinion, you mentioned a few ways, but like in your opinion, opinion, like what would you say is the best way of consistently generating good leads and referrals? Hmm. I think consistency is like you just said, just being consistent, always adding value. Um, people don't necessarily want you to be consistently following up saying, how are you? Like what you've been up to this weekend? Like people, people ain't got interest in that unless you're friends with them. Um, and you know, I've developed quite good relationships with people here to the point where we probably could do that. But always trying to bring value then meant that any time an opportunity came up on their side that they could recommend me for, they did. Um, so I just stayed very consistent in that. And and it's very easy to do when you have a niche because you so, can so, always. So when you, when you say value, Lewis, people will be going, what do you mean, like value what? In, in what how do you mean? So and I'm, right now, I mean, I, I run my own podcast, which is certainly one value that I can bring. You know, I can give them a platform to actually come onto my show, have access to a network that they wouldn't normally have access to and talk about themselves or an interesting project or a, a, an experience that they've had in their career. That's one way. Another way is introducing other people to them that are also in the space. Like, I don't know why people don't do that more often. Being a connector. Being so it's a like, connector. Would, it, would it be like... Hey, Lewis, look, um, we spoke the other day. I spoke to this uh, other lady the other day who's on a similar journey. I thought I'd connect you because she might be able to help you. Or Is it literally as simple as that? Simple as that. There's, there's, no, mm. there's no science behind it. It's just like 
okay, cool, you do this and it's relative or relevant to this person. So why don't I connect you to? One one thing I would obviously be a little bit cautious of is if you've got a hiring manager and you keep connecting him to, you know, potential candidates, you're probably, <laughs> yeah, cool. not, you're probably not going to make money. But if you are hiring leaders with other leaders or other data scientists with other data scientists and they, you know, they, they posted something recently or you perhaps tag that person in their post, just, just connecting people, people appreciate that. Yeah. And I think what I love about that, and I've experienced this in, in my own career is like, basically it's the mindset of give them more than you take. Right. And actually what actually ends up happening is you end up getting more in return anyway, when you actually do that in the real honest way. Do you know what I mean? I uh, agreed. And, and that, that's, that's the key point. If you're doing it authentically, if, yeah. you, if you're actually doing it because you want to make the community better, but obviously we're recruiters. So there is a, you know, there is a, an underlying thing there that we want to pick up business. But if you're doing it because you're interested in the space and that, that would, that would probably be another thing. Like it's very easy to, to find interest in something. If, if you actually pick a vertical that you're interested in or a space that actually excites you, it's very interesting. It's very easy to pick up skill and knowledge around it mm. and, and natural language. If you would to look back at my school days, which I hated, um, I probably would have never thought that I'd be working very closely with linguists. Um, in fact, I probably didn't even know what a linguist was, but there's something really interesting about language that, that actually makes my ability to be able to talk to people much more genuine. Yeah. Okay. So where do you think most people go wrong with client development? Follow-ups. Yeah. Follow-ups. Like, more. So I think people tend to, to follow up with an agenda like they're always trying to get something out of it. Again, coming back to adding that value. So client development isn't, again, it's not a short-term thing. You will get short-term wins. Sometimes, I think I actually hold the record at Darwin for the fastest ever placement made was sort of 19 hours from picking up a new business, finding a new candidate and having them sign a contract on a perm role with like three interviews. Wow. Yeah. So it can, I, I'm, I'm a testament that it can happen really quick. But if you don't do anything with it thereafter, then you're not going to build a relationship with that client. And so many times I see people that do great work with the business. They do maybe one, two, sometimes three placements. And then you never hear anything more about that business ever again, because they get side, they get, you know, I guess distracted or sidetracked and start doing the same for another business and the same for another business and the same for another business. And then when they look back on the year and they go, well, who are your clients? And they go, uh, I did some placements, but I haven't got any clients. So I think, following up showing a genuine interest in those businesses understanding the projects yes we're recruiters but there's so many other ways that we can actually add value to that team again whether that be introducing them to people whether that be bringing them on a podcast whether that be sharing relevant knowledge or competitors knowledge with them data on the market like there's just so many things you can do to continue adding value beyond just placing people in their team yeah Love that. So, so recruiters might be listening now, Lewis, and be going, okay, well, how, how do I make sure I do that with the right clients? So mm. how, how do you sort of judge it yourself or what do you look for for you to go, you know what? One, I need to have a bit of a plan as to how I take this client from two free placements a year to six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. But like, what, what do you look for in, from a client relationship to be like, right, I need to make sure that I put more effort into this to expand in this account it's kind of weird because i'm not i'm not entirely sure that i can give a fair response to that because i don't necessarily have a strategy it's just in me to stay in touch mm. it's just it's just important that i i never well i try not to look back at a business and go oh, when was the last time i contacted them like no. i always know that i'm doing something with them and, and try not to overstretch like you don't need 50 clients you really don't to be successful you can have five maybe 10 businesses, 10 even a stretch, five businesses that you just see as as, as your next 12 months of, of success and you just invest all of your time into to getting to know those companies. I think just don't overstretch yourself and it's, and it's kind of easy to then stay in touch with people and to constantly loop them into things you're doing. That, that for me is, is how I've seen success in, in the relationships I've built. Now that makes sense, I guess, because you do stay in touch so much, you've got a real understanding of where the business is going. And yeah. I guess if you just have a lot of touch points and you're like, well, actually they've just told me that 
they um, failed at securing more funding or they've just got funding. It's like, right, that, that, that'll spur that on, I guess, won't it? Because you're, you're making sure you've already, you've always, always got current context that exactly. I guess will encourage you to be like, right, I need to stay on top of that. Or actually, I probably need to start looking at getting more referrals or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I will say as well that in the American market, as I mentioned earlier, that you do have a lot more relationships with internal recruiters. Those, those internal recruiters out here move quite often. So right. you can pick up a business, build a great relationship, and that's and that's good because wherever that internal recruiter might go next, you might end up building a relationship there. But if you don't create multiple points of contact in that business, as soon as that recruiter leaves, you've got no chance of working in that business. You've then got to restart that whole process of trying to build a relationship with someone. New. And it doesn't matter if you made six placements there or not. So having multiple points of contact in a business is super is super important. And that creates more opportunity as well for people to to reference your work internally. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, especially when if if you've learned through mistakes that the best way to get in with businesses is internal recruitment. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you've had to that's where you start because you don't want to rub them up the wrong way and that's what you did wrong. But and then I'm assuming once you've started to form that relationship, what then do you openly communicate that look? It'd be great if I could communicate to X or I don't know, like how, how do you then expand that? Cause I guess like you, you don't want to rub them up the wrong way. You just, you just left. I mean, at the end of the day, they can actually be really helpful. Um, and I know that kind of goes, I, maybe I'm talking about a turn here, but I think that goes against a lot of the mindsets of external agencies in, in European markets. In the, 100%. Oh, I hear all the time. The I devil. hate internal recruiters. Yeah. yeah. Like I hear it all the time. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> but that's just, that's just not the case here. If you build those relationships well, you almost won't have to ask for that that um, opportunity to speak to a hiring manager because if you're servicing them well, you're making them look good, you're doing what they ask. Um, occasionally, if you need to push, you push. You don't push too often. They'll they'll introduce you to the business because it's one less thing that they need to do. One thing to keep in mind here is that a lot of the internal recruiters aren't specialists in a vertical either. So I had a conversation. Everything. They do everything. I spoke to a business recently and they were looking for, for 12 immediate hires in engineering and then 30 over the next 12 months. But and I was like, okay, well, that's huge growth. And they was like, oh, there's only two of us. And I was like, wow, that's oh. a lot just for two of you. She said, no, no, that's just engineering. I've got 120 roles. I was like, oh, wow. okay. So how can you how can you service your business as two, three people for 120 positions? You can't. It's too many. And you can't specialize. So they do really value these specialist relationships. So if you bring a, a niche to the table and you can add value and you understand the business and you respect the process that they're giving you, because they're all slightly different. You just have to, I guess you just have to become a little bit more emotionally intelligent with the, uh, the people that you're working with. And, and, you know, I'm not necessarily someone to be told what to do all the time, but you kind of do have to honor the process and that process will create opportunity for you if you stick to it and, and you continue bringing value. So, so to, tie, to tie this all together then, Lewis, is yeah. like American market, like internal recruitment, you, you need to make sure you're on their side, you're building relationships, don't, yeah, go uh, rubbing everyone up the wrong way. Um, and then also, as you're just saying, like make sure that you make them aware how much value you can bring, your specialist, and that goes a long way. So I guess what, what has been your most successful way then to wrap this together of building these relationships, these internal recruiters? Is it just, again, just staying in touch, delivering value, respecting the process, just doing those things? Then when they do give you that opportunity, they do give you that branch, you grab it with both hands and that absolutely deliver a high level of service. Yeah, there's there's nothing there's nothing more to that, really. I'm not saying that you just have to do, again, you don't have to do everything they tell you to do in terms of like following the process. You can speak to the hiring managers. Like as long as you're, as long as you're including them in stuff, you know, if there, if there was a if there was a reason for you to reach out to to the hiring manager that you're supporting, as long as they're involved in the process, they're pretty cool with giving you freedom. They just mm -hmm. want to have some level of oversight. And again, like we're here to make them look good as much as we are us look good. So as long mm -hmm. as you're as long as you're expressing that and letting them know that that's why you're here and not to to you know to to damage their career in any way, like it, for me, that's been the key to success. Yeah, love that. So it took you 18 months or so to get to the mark you needed to, and then you, that's when you moved over to America. Where yeah. did you initially live then, Lewis? Where did you move to? So moved to Boston, um, 
the four of us actually, uh, three of us, sorry, moved into a, a shared house or apartment, which was interesting. Did that help, living together? Oh, I hated it. Oh, you yeah, hated I hate it. it? Yeah, I hated it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did, it, yeah, it was, um, and don't get me wrong, I loved, and I still do, the guys that were in my team at the time. Um, they've kind of gone into different journeys now themselves, but um, we had we had a good time. But it was in the depth of winter. When we arrived, it was like uh, they called it the bomb cyclone. No joke. Got off the plane. Ice hit me from this direction. Really? Wind, wind hit me from this direction. It was like, what have we done? Like, <laughs> where are we? <laughs> so we were like confined to the office and then straight back to this apartment with the same people all the time. And it was wow, outside of it man. being exciting, being somewhere new. We really couldn't go out and do much. So we just spent a lot of time together, which – it was again it was fun but it just wasn't for me i didn't yeah, move out there for, yeah. yeah i didn't move out there for that reason um but that being said we needed that time to to actually go and find ourselves an apartment and move out and stuff so i moved into my own apartment and um and actually now i've, I've moved just just slightly outside of the city um on the basis that we've actually decided to go fully remote as a as a u.s entity now and that's right. given us the ability to be able to to hire way more people and, and much, you know, much better talent, which actually reverting back to something we said earlier, when we were talking about Atlanta, we thought that would be really difficult to hire. Boston's even harder. Mm. And I think a common problem that I've seen in European agencies that have come to America is that it's very difficult to hire Americans because Why? there is, because there's such a great career path for internal recruiters. You can go into a business have your lunch paid for, create, a, you know, have a great environment, comfortability, 401k, healthcare benefits, because by the way, they cost a bomb that people don't even consider when they get here. The cost of staying healthy is un like unbelievable here. Really? Um, yeah. Um, like six, 700 a month you're spending on, on healthcare benefits if you're, if you're not covered by your business. Wow. That's before you go to the doctors and then they smash you with a two grand deductible. So it's like, yeah, things that you need to consider, but, there's this illustrious career that you can go and work internally, go straight in on a hundred K and, and like have none of the stress that you would in an external agency when it comes to um, going out and winning business. So it's, it was very difficult to be able to convince people to come and join a startup that no one knew about in an office space that at the time was dated. So it wasn't that attractive in terms of a location to work. Yeah. We actually upgraded it to a WeWork office that, that made a big difference. Um, and and then to say, okay, cool. Well, we're going to pay half you half the amount of money as a base salary than you would <laughs> if you were working for one of these really cool companies that everyone wants to work for. It was just hard. Yeah. And I think this 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 now remote opportunity, COVID has done us wonders in that respect. It's forced our hand. We were kind of going in that direction anyway, but it's forced our hand. That we've already made two really really good hires that uh, that one has joined us and one that's going to be joining us mid November. Amazing. So yeah. how how is the American business done performance wise then, mate? So gave us a bit of an insight into eighteen months had the target. Like how has the trajectory been since you've been over there in terms of billings and stuff like that? So in the first eighteen months, you know, it was it was I guess I, I want to call it a research trial and error period. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. And when we got here, to be honest, we were still figuring out the direction. So we still had one of our consultants doing a lot of work in Georgia and San Francisco. We had a few clients in Boston. We were doing some stuff in New York and it, it was kind of like trial and error. Um, and I guess you, you almost don't factor in some of the challenges as well of, of moving people from one country to another from a personality perspective, like from a, from a, they're, they're no longer at home and they struggle with other things. And the first few years were slow. Like I, I can't sit here and say that we were super successful. Over the last over the last year, though, in the last kind of twelve to sixteen months, we've seen much more success, and we're now, I think, we probably closer to the million dollar mark from last year, and we're probably on target to achieve that or one point one one point two million. Realistically, I believe our business really started about sixteen months ago, when we yeah, finally yeah. had a strategy, when we finally had a team, when we finally created an environment that people wanted to work in. Um, we just wasted a few years. Mm. And, I, and I'm sure, like, I'm sure if my CEO could claw back some of that cash and time, he would. And I would, I would love to be able to do that for him. But you know, 
I guess it, it created the foundation of where we are now. And, and, I, and I know that that would be a good investment long term when we look back and be like, OK, cool. At least we figured out what not to do. Yeah. So, so I'm definitely going to ask you for, for those UK agencies, UK recruiters looking to come over to America, like how they should approach it, whatever, from your learnings. But, but before we finish, mate, like just you talking about there, the challenges and what you had to go through. Uh, you do strike me as someone that has um, really cultivated resilience. Mm. Like, what, what's what been your journey in that in terms of Lewis's mindset? Um, and what helped you mentally get through that period? Because you're in a completely different country. I haven't got your family there, I'm assuming. Obviously, you're with your guys that you're seeing 24 hours a day, which would have been fucking annoying. <laughs> right? So, like, what, like, how did you get through that mentally? What, what did you do there? So it wasn't, it wasn't something I developed when I got here. If I'm being honest, we, we spent a lot of time together as a team. And in those initial 18 months, there was a level of dedication that we all, you know, we, we put our personal lives aside and we committed to each other that this is what we were going to do. And this is, and, and without each other, we couldn't get to America. Yeah. Simple Collective goal. Yeah. Collective goal. And what made it very easy is although I didn't want to live with these guys, um, they they were people I wanted to be around. We created a, albeit, you know, it was it was only three or four of us. It was a culture that I just wanted to wake up and be involved in every day. I didn't want to wake up and be involved in that at home, but I, I wanted to go to the office and 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 their motivation motivated me. So it was a collective effort. And I think that's what kept us all sane. And that being said, you know, we're in a new environment. It was just exciting. Yeah. Um, from a personal perspective, I just don't like losing. Really? I just, I really don't like losing. Um, I guess in my, I want to say my older age, in my thirties now, um, I'm 30 by the way, not in my thirties. That makes me sound good. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess I've become a better, a better loser. <laughs> mm. um, I just, I hated coming second. I hated it with a passion. And for me to have people look at me on a personal level and say, well, you failed, crushed me. So I was like, I have to win. Like, I, I have to come out here and make this successful. And actually, funnily enough, did that mean that it was I was the right person to be leading the team? Actually, in time, we realized that there's probably someone better suited to that and that I can motivate the team and be part of the team in a different way, which is then when I moved into this, this more um, director of business development Based position where I still have a lot of involvement in mentoring and working alongside the guys and bringing in business and that kind of stuff. But we brought in a fantastic team leader who just understands how to to manage people in a team that perhaps is still quite junior. Um, so just being accepting of the fact that I can't be great at everything, mm. and and to then focus on you know a few things. The same with the clients, bring in a few clients and, and focus on them like hone in a few of your skills and focus on those skills and have other people around to support you. Yeah. That's Love what that. got me through it. Yeah. And then, and then that being said, coming to America with an English accent, mate, <laughs> it makes it very easy to make friends. Does it? <laughs> oh, I, honestly, I, I didn't believe it till I came here. And really? uh, yeah, I didn't believe it. And just, you, you well, we, are we talking about guy mates? Are we talking about birds here? Lewis? Both, both, <laughs> Honest, honestly, both. You, you just, pe just people want to know you. Um, people want to talk to you. We, we, Boston has a very good fitness scene, and the guys that were in the team at the time were all into fitness. So we went to this gym, and it was just full of people, and we were the right. only English people there. So everyone wanted to train with us. Um, nice. And then, look, <laughs> without going into too much depth, I've got a, you know, I've got a baby on the way, and <laughs> a very secure relationship. <laughs> <laughs> But it helped. It helped with the yeah, amazing. As well. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I was going to say. So, like, Lewis, three best, three best bits of advice then for recruiters that are like that really like the opportunity or like the sound of opportunity of taking their recruitment career career to America. Hopefully, that can still happen with all the madness that's going on. But like, what would your three bet best bits of advice be for for those looking to take their career to the to the states? I would say. Again, going back to patience, be patient. Don't expect to, to hit the ground running. Uh, don't expect to, to be able to bring the skill sets you have and then just work here. You have to, you have to adapt. Um, I think 
be prepared for change because everything changes, not just the market that you're doing recruitment in. Your entire life changes. It's as much a mental game as it is anything else. When you get here, you don't have the resources that you had at home. You can't go out with your mates on a Friday for beers. You can once you've got mates. But that mm. period of time when you get here is difficult, especially if you're not someone who's really comfortable going up to talking and talking to random people. So mentally, you need to be prepared for that disconnect. You're going to be on your own. Even if your business is with you, even if your colleagues are by your side, there are going to be times where you sit there going, oh, my God, I, I don't know anyone. Like I can't yeah, be prepared can't for that. Yeah, be, be really, really prepared for that. That I, I would say that's probably where a lot of people fail and they just get homesick. Um, and then finally, be prepared for the success. Like doing a placement in Europe is cool and you can earn good money, but doing one in America when it's worth four times more than it is in Europe, you earn a lot of money and, and you can earn it very quickly. And I would say just be prepared for that. So it can play as much into the mental game as, as when you earn a load of cash, don't just go out and spend it all at once because you're back in that lonely place again with no money. Like be strategic with, with how you save and invest your money, um, which I've started to do more so now, I guess, with my responsibilities that are pending. Um, <laughs> I, did, I did have fun. You know, we, we were on the tables. We were dropping thousands of dollars. We were buying nice suits and we did all that when we first got here and, and you know, we saw the, the short-term success. But just, just have a plan for how you're going to manage your success. Um, and it would just put you in a great mental state. And that that would be my three tips, really. Yeah, no, I love that. And I don't think enough people talk about that, Lewis. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, you just hear about people buying all the nice things and all that, right? Um, it, do, it doesn't but, mean it does. It doesn't mean anything. It's it actually at the yeah. end of the day, like you can have a Rolex, but have a hundred bucks in your account and you're not rich. Mm. You look, you look rich, but you're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Lewis, I've got five quick fire questions for you, mate. So All right, the end let's of this. go. All right, let's go. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to answer them quickly, but I'm just, I'm just going to hit you with five questions. All right. So, first one: if you could change the industry, what would you improve? If I could change the industry, what would I improve? People's people's perception of recruiters. Mm. Um, there's a very negative connotation around our industry and I can understand why in certain cases, but if there was one thing I could change, it would be businesses perception of recruiters and that if they didn't slam the door, as soon as we picked up the phone or sent an email because of the fact that we're called a recruiter, that would, that would change a lot because we, we bring value. I, I truly believe that. Yeah. What book have you read that has had the biggest impact on you? Uh, I've got to be honest. I'm not a book reader. Audible. Um, I, I, I've got. I like listening to like the cheesy motivational YouTube videos of like The Rock or ET. Right. Um, <laughs> getting and and I, it's pretty sad. But I listen to them in the morning when I'm in the shower. All right. What's um, your go? All right. Let's do that. What's your go-to motivational video in the morning that gets you g'd up? I like, I like Eric Thomas where he talks about, you know, walking into the sea and um, keep going, keep going and, until you can't breathe. Um, and that's, that's when, you know, yeah, love that. ET's, ET's the man. <laughs> if, uh, if you could write a LinkedIn post that could be seen by every single recruitment consultant across the world, what would you want it to say? Ah. What would I want it to say? That's a tough one, man. <laughs> I think you might have stumped me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, list, listen, start listening. Stop talking. Like that. What did you spend your first biggest commission paycheck on? Uh, I bought a car. Yeah. Oh, My, um, it, car. I, at the time, it was an A-class Mercedes. Um, it, it was... Brand new in the UK at the time, white leather interior. It was all tricked out with the AMG kit on it. Um, felt like a badass. Did you? Love that. Yeah, mate. yeah. It was like um, it was like a poor man's Mercedes. It was like <laughs> it, it, it had all of the bells and whistles, but it was the cheapest one in the range. But it still felt good. <laughs> Love that, mate. Last one. What's 
the ultimate goal for your recruitment career? Honestly, I think asking me this question six months ago probably wouldn't be different. Um, but to create a, a very good, stable foundation for my family. Um, I have a baby on the way. My perspective's changed. And, it, and I'm sure it will come March 4th if he arrives on time. Um, don't worry, I've got a bet on it because I'm competitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I would say just creating stability for my family whilst also not, not sacrificing the niceties. You know, I, what I'm not doing is just putting money away for his college degree. Like I'm not, I'm not sacrificing going out for nice meals and having a good time and, and like surprising my girlfriend with gifts and sending stuff back home. Like I'm never going to sacrifice those things, but I, I want to make sure that I'm able to do that comfortably with no worries. And I know that recruitment can give me that platform. Yeah. So do yeah. I, do I have a career goal in mind? I'm not entirely sure of how high I can go. I think the, the sky's the limit, but, but yeah, that's the, that's the aim. Lewis, it's been a pleasure. Lovely. Appreciate it, Jim.